Our speaker today is the principal engineer at Tekton, where he currently leads uh, the open source development of Fist the tool. And he is also the creator of the tool. Uh, Willem pre previously founded and led the data science platform team at Gojek in Southeast Asia, where he helped build a platform and that supported a variety of models and handled hundreds of millions of orders every month. His current, his current focus is building data and machine learning tooling to allow organizations to scale machine learning and drive decision making. In a previous life, Willem uh, founded and sold the networking startup and was a software engineer in um, industrial control systems. Yeah, without further ado, I'll just pass the baton to Willem. All right, thanks, uh, Natu. Um, yeah, thanks for that intro. Um, you touched on the high level of like in my background, but I think a key thing to note is that, yeah, I, we spent about four years at Gojek. Um, that was a company that was really important in the, you know, my understanding of the ML and data space. A um, little bit of detail about that company. It's a, a decacorn. It's a very large company in Southeast Asia. Um, so they do ride hailing, food delivery, digital payments, a bunch of things. And so we grew the data science team to 60, 70 data scientists. And we built the ML platform team to support that data science team, allowing them to get their models into production. Um, so Feast was one of the, the products we built there. It's a tool we built there and it was critical for our infrastructure, our ML infrastructure. And we co-developed that with Google Cloud and open sourced that. And about a year ago, um, I joined Tekton where we continue to invest into Feast as an open source offering, but we also have a managed um, product, a, a, a enterprise feature store. And um, these two products together are, um, you know, essentially we, we wanna make them the best in class, the best open source and the best enterprise feature store. So this talk today, um, it's gonna to be about recommender systems for feature stores and for Feast. It's, it's specific to recommender systems. So if you don't have high familiarity with feature stores, you know, the first half of it will be a little bit um, Rexus focused, but in the second half, you know, I'll talk about Feast a little bit and maybe I'll just go to the agenda. Um, so the, the first off, I'll give you a bit of background on these two topics, feature stores and, and uh, recommender systems. Some of the challenges you face when you try and build recommender systems. Um, but at the end, we'll talk a bit about how Feast can help you with recommender systems um, and, you know, alleviate some of these challenges. Um, so at that part of the talk, I think would be a good place to perhaps ask questions about Feast if, you know, if it's a, if I'm a bit hand wavy or high level, happy to drill into specific areas. Um, but you know, the first half we'll talk mostly about recommender systems and then some of the unique challenges. Cool. I'm just going to continue. So I think recommender systems to most people here, if you're an ML, is just something familiar. Um, it's probably the most common use case in machine learning. It's definitely one of the most impactful ones. You know, typical places you'll see that is, you know, recommending music for on Spotify or Netflix movie recommendations. Um, you know, even the or the feeds that you see in a lot of the, you know, social media platforms are recommender systems, um, and typically these are built by data scientists that do the modeling, data engineers that productionize the data pipelines and you know, data infrastructure, um, as well as the platform engineers that run the underlying platforms that operate these systems. Um, and for most companies, you know, when you're building a recommender system, you start with something basic. Uh, you know, you just recommend items or products to customers based on you know, popularity or some kind of heuristic. And then over time, you, you tend to introduce uh, machine learning for you know, batch scoring, training and scoring, and then eventually you move to online predictions. Um, but as you move along that trend, increasingly you'll face operational challenges. And so we'll dive into some of those operational challenges that you'll face today. And at the end, we'll talk about how Feast fits into this that picture and how feature stores can actually help you with solving that problem. So what is a feature store? So a feature store is a system that manages the ingestion, storage, uh, and storage of streaming and batch data. So one of the things it does is it allows you to add and connect data sources. So you know, whether that's your offline sources, like your BigQuery's or Redshifts or Parquet files on an object store, or whether it's you know, Kafka or Kinesis streams, it allows you to connect those um, sources. And then on top of that, allows you to define standardized definitions 
Um, and basically these are logical abstractions. So you have something called the feature repository where you essentially model your data based on your data sources. And then you can ingest data from the sources into the feature store and then retrieve features from the feature store. Um, and so you can do that for building training data sets um, in a point in time correct way, as well as retrieve features for online serving. Um, and the reason the feature store is so important in a, a modern ML um, system is because it provides that unified retrieval layer. Models need to see a single view of the world and the feature store provides that single view. And as a, as a data scientist, feature stores provide a way for you to get into production. So you define these data models on top of your data sources. You can do feature engineering with the feature store and you can publish those uh, you know, definitions, let's say to a Git repo. And then the CI process basically updates the feature store, the metadata in the feature store. And the feature store takes care of all of the data operations like loading data from the sources, transforming that data, storing that data, and then serving and validating it, serving it out to models and then validating that. Um, so that's really what the feature store provides for you as a, as a user. Um, and one other thing to note here is that data scientists and engineers together work on feature stores. So a data scientist is often the one that does the modeling and the engineer is the one operating the feature store and ensuring that your online models in production are you know, running safely and reliably. Um, so, but one thing that, one other thing that's very important to note is that feature stores are operational systems. They're typically more useful when you have low latency or real-time use cases, less useful if you're just doing like, you know, batch and offline uh, modeling. So let's talk a bit about some of the recommender system challenges that, you know, you'll face uh, if you build a recommendation system. A typical flow for a company or a team is, uh, ML team is uh, for building a recommender system is identifying some kind of business use case. Um, and, you know, if, like we said, with examples earlier, if you're like an e-commerce site, maybe you want to recommend some products to your user and there are different kinds of recommendations. So you can do like some similar items if they've purchased an item or just provide some kind of initial list for users to, you know, what, is, what are they most likely to purchase? Um, and that list, if you aren't using emails, most often just like the most popular items on your platform. Um, but over time, you can introduce machine learning in order to be a little bit more intelligent about what you recommend to users. Um, and so what a lot of companies do is they just do batch recommendations. And so you can use collaborative filtering or some kind of modeling process where you have a pipeline that trains and scores a set of recommendations for each user. So you basically pre-calculate recommendations for a user. When they actually open up your website, then you can you just serve that to them. And maybe you'll have some kind of fallback. So if you if you haven't seen that user before, and it's a, it's a cold start, essentially, you can just recommend some kind of list of items to that to that user. And then when you have data, you can be more intelligent and then retrain this, this, these recommendations at the end of the day, or it's on some kind of schedule. So batch recommendations is, um, is still served online, even though the training and scoring happens offline, um, but it's very effective and it's probably where most companies stop. Um, you, you can go to online recommendations and that improves things somewhat, but it also comes with a lot of challenges. Um, so when you get to online recommendations, and, and then I'll talk about like at Gojek, why that was important for us is that... Um, in, in our case at Gojek, we had you know, tens of thousands of restaurants. Um, we had uh, many geographic areas that we had to service and we had many, you know, hundreds, hundreds of millions of customers. And so you can't pre-train or batch score all the recommendations for all customers. And the key space is like too, too large. And so you have to have an online system that does these recommendations. And there's complexity that comes with this online system because essentially you're you're generating some, you're generating, you're calculating a recommendation um, at request time. Um, so there's a complexity that we can talk about in a bit, but you know, you, you just, you'd introduce systems like a candidate generation server that would look up a list of um, candidates, for example, like which restaurants to show to a customer or which food delivery item, uh, food items to recommend for them to purchase. Um, but producing those candidates comes with like a lot of like modeling challenges and, 
um, you know, query time challenges and latency challenges. Um, and of course, if you go into online recommendations, you also have things like training serving SKU because now part of your process is offline. You're training your model offline, but when you move online, then suddenly there's, you know, a, it's a different environment, different languages being used, different data being fed in. And so SKU can occur between, you know, offline and online data. And then finally, you can become more intelligent with your, um, by chaining ML models and uh, looking into things like you know, ML fairness, re-ranking and explainability and all those things like optimizing the cold start problem. Um, so we'll talk a bit about uh, the online recommendations or a little bit more on online recommendations in this talk. But um, yeah, this is the typical flow that a team goes through. And so some of these challenges, and we've I've gone class them into different groups here, um, but these are the, some of the, the main ones that you'll face when building an online recommender system. So operationally, you need fresh features and um, you need to be able to retrieve them at low latency. Of course, you know you have user behavior changing the whole time. You, you need to update the, the features. You, you've got new products coming in. Um, you need to be able to update uh, your online stores. And especially if you're doing online predictions, you can't be running a day old data uh, depending on how, you know, how frequently things are changing, of course, in your organization. Um, so that's an operational challenge. Um, in terms of feature engineering, um, often you want to compute features on request data. So imagine that a user is you know, clicking on items in your, on your platform or you know, there's some kind of behavior that they have that you, can, you, you produce a feature from. Um, that, that often you want to compute that at request time. And so you want to combine that event data um, that is being sent to your backend with features that are pre-computed or raw data that's pre-computed. Um, so that is an operational challenge. And another operational challenge for in-feature engineering is um, you know, supporting time travel. Uh, most of the line of business type of um, data that you deal with is time series. Um, so you have some features or attributes about a, a, an entity like a customer or, or a product changing over time, and you need to be able to join between those um, seamlessly. A, th a third challenge is how do you deal with data quality? Um, the training serving skew we sp I spoke about earlier, um, or just like upstream sources that are bad. Um, a fourth category is organizational. And this is something we actually saw a lot of at, at Gojek, um, just like data scientists and engineers that have different incentives. Data scientists want to get into production. They want to experiment. They want to iterate quickly. Engineers want to stabilize and make sure that you know things stay up and that the business doesn't lose a lot of money because you know the wrong things are being served to, to customers. Um, and so and there's a tension there and tooling often can help there. At least in our case, the feature store really helped um, alleviate some of those frictions. Um, you have things like multiple business objectives or just objectives that are changing over time. Um, the need for running A-B tests. Um, you have other miscellaneous problems like a you know, cold store problem that is intrinsic to recommendation systems as well as um, you know, privacy and GDPR and compliance type of um, challenges that you face with recommender systems. And of course, recommender systems are really you know, top of mind for a lot of people because of the impact that they can have on you know, users. So um, there's a lot of like, you know, other kinds of areas, other kinds of challenges that you'll face that are non-technical. Um, I'm gonna just stop there uh, or is everyone still with me? Can I just continue or? Uh, yes, all good. Uh, but uh, anyone that has questions, please feel free to add the questions to the chat. Cool. Yeah, so let me dive into two of these challenges. I'm going to dive into uh, low latency access um, to fresh features. And then after this, I'll dive into another one of these, um, which is correctness. And the reason I kind of hoist these two challenges out is because they're two ones that I think the feature store is really well positioned to help uh, users solve. So one of the challenges that you'll face with recommender systems is you know, how do you achieve low latency? Latency matters. So it's not just about the recommendations, but also like how quickly you can serve those recommendations. If it takes you 10 seconds, you'll have a drop off of users. And so you really want to achieve relatively low latency, often in the order of like 50 milliseconds or less, um, but, but rarely in the like second range uh, for an online system like e-commerce or some kind of uh, you know, Netflix or you know, Spotify style system. Um, but you know, you'll have a bunch of challenges with that, uh, or at least considerations. 
So the first is like, you know, you probably want to have some kind of caching layer, either in process or external. And so let's say you're using like a big table or a dynamo for your online store or for your recommendation system, maybe you want to have a Redis that is deployed for caching your popular entities. Um, you, and you know, that creates you know, operational overhead and maintenance overhead. You want to do things like deduplicating entities in your requests. So let's say somebody's requesting, um, you know, a bunch of features. How do you ensure that you don't do redundant lookups? And um, that's another consideration. Um, you want to reduce the request size of the incoming request. So let's say somebody, let's say you're just looking up like a, let's say you're looking up like a hundred features. Um, how do you ensure that the incoming payload doesn't have to have a reference to each feature individually? So having an awareness of the clients that are going to be looking up features can reduce the amount of data that's being sent over the wire. And so we solve that problem with feature services in Feast. Um, so it's basically a awareness that the feature store has of models that are going to consume it in production. And so it, maybe we can just have like a unique ID for retrieving a bunch of features. Um, there's other optimizations like you can make with Arrow IPC as an you know, a, a inter-process uh, communication protocol that allows you to use zero copy um, you know, zero copy for uh, uh, changes or uh, transmission of data. Uh, with one major downside is that something like an error IPC comes with the trade off of really poor storage um, versus protobuf. And so I think a trend you'll find with feature stores is that there's a lot of these like trade offs that you have to make because tools are being built for a single use case, either offline or online. And the feature store really helps you with making a lot of those decisions and making them seamless as opposed to having to make them individually um, yourself. Um, and then finally, you'll have like other systems like uh, a candidate generation layer that you'll need to manage if you want to achieve really low latency. So just to kind of like sp spell out the individual challenges for like really low latency retrieval um, of fresh features, um, there's, there's four that to me come to mind. The first is you need to manage the data models. And, and so there's often a tension between how features are created and how they're consumed. And so when you're modeling features for your production system, you maybe have like a bunch of pipelines that are just creating features. Like they say you've got a bunch of airflow pipelines or you know some kind of system like DBT that's producing tables of features or aggregated values. And different teams create different tables and streams of features. And that gets populated maybe into an online store. But the modeling that, you, so, so you need to manage those data models, but the consumption side is different, right? Because you're pulling the features from multiple of those tables. And so if you really want to optimize that, you'd actually group and store those features together in a single place for it to be read. Um, but the, that's a dial that creates a lot of trade-offs because you can you know, pre-join everything in a single table for all of your consumers, but that uses a lot more storage space. Um, and that is just technically challenging and that adds a latency and delay to your um, kind of end-to-end -end flow. Um, there are also other challenges like how do you um, enable reuse across models because you can store all of your data on a single server on a single, let's say, Redis node, uh, but there, that creates a hotspot. So how do you distribute across multiple nodes and kind of balance the data modeling um, out? Um, uh, dealing with these types, and like this, this is very, uh, uh, this is the second point here. It's like you have data source type systems, like your Redshift and your BigQuery and all those. And then you have your notebook and your iterative type systems, like your Python and Pandas or you know, whatever you're using within your development environment. Um, then you have the, the kind of transmission formats, whether that's gRPC or Arrow or Proto, um, as well as like, how do you store those in your online store? And if you're building an operational system, this becomes a lot more uh, front and, and center because you need to convert between these types and you're either going to have a loss of data or you're going to have some kind of, you know, because these type systems don't map one-to-one, -one, some kind of challenges in mapping these, these together because ultimately you want an end-to-end -end flow and right at the end of that flow, you want a model being trained or you have a, want a model being served. But if you have drifts in your data and incorrect type mappings, then you're going to have a lot of problems. Um, and I think the last point here is just like an arrow is not really a good storage format. Um, the third challenge is just optimizing for batch retrieval. So batch in this case is not offline um, in that sense. It's more the 
unique requirement that recommender systems have online of looking up many uh, entities. So you want to surface many recommendations, right? You never want to or rarely want to surface a single recommendation because that doesn't really make much sense. Um, and so there are some challenges regarding that. So, you know, obviously in the offline case, you have columnar processing, which has all kinds of different workflows and tools involved with it. Um, and the way you optimize that is slightly different from how you optimize the online flow. Um, so maybe you use Parquet and Arrow offline or some kind of uh, OLAP processing, but in the online case, you're very row centric. Um, so how you store that um, is, is kind of different. Um, and of course, with, with batch retrieval, you can't really optimize um, because, you know, like what I said earlier is you, you can't really, you don't know which entities will be locked up by a user or will be recommended for them. So you don't know which keys will be hit. So you can't aggregate those together. And so you lose a lot of the benefits of these, these batch systems like Arrow in the, in the online case. Um, so deduplication of, deduplicating of requested entities, often you just want to make sure that the same entities are not looked up in a single incoming request. So that's just like simple overhead uh, that you want to remove. Online store specific optimizations that you have to make. So if you're using Redis or Dynamo or whatever it is, the query pattern really matters. If you're looking up a single feature uh, for a single user or item, um, you know, that's completely different from doing a, a range scan that is geographically constrained or potentially looking up all keys and understanding the online store nuances and idiosyncrasies is incredibly important. Um, and then finally, handling like large number of entities. Uh, you know, if you constantly have data scientists producing new features, creating new data models and shipping that into production, um, that's great because it frees them up, but it also creates a lot of like, you know, dead code that either in your staging environment or in production that ulti ultimately produces, sorry, not dead code, um, like stale data and, and dead data that's not being used. Something needs to go and clean that up and cleaning that up is challenging because it can affect your latencies. So you can imagine like, you know, data being ingested, um, not being used anymore, and you'll need to have some kind of process that deletes keys and de deletes those values over time. Um, you want to do things like uh, another challenge is you want to do things like caching, um, like popular entities, um, and that's a very common use case because they'll just be constantly hit. Um, you want to do things like enable range queries. So in the Gojek case, you you know we couldn't recommend, uh, or we had a candidate server that would, would pull a list of uh, nearby restaurants, but in order to identify nearby restaurants, you'd need to geographically constrain the query and that query needs to be pushed down into the database and if we don't do that then we're recommending like i don't know a hundred thousand restaurants and then filtering it down client side um, and that would take about 10 seconds to do and that's prohibitively slow and so enabling range queries is definitely a first class problem in um you know online recommender systems there's a second area that I think is very important is correctness of data. Um, and, you know, this is related to the storage and data model um, constraints and uh, you know, the area of interest that we spoke about earlier. Um, but it's basically like, how do you ensure that bad data coming into the system is identified and, you know, prevented from actually affecting your you know, production systems? So the, the considerations or at least examples that come to mind are, you know, how do you know that if a feature is missing or an entity is missing, that that is surfaced to the client that is consuming recommendations from you. Um, perhaps all the recommendations that you're serving um, is based on features that don't exist. Like it's just a complete cold start. Um, and you you know, as a client, you want to know that. And so you can do things like encode the status um, in the response or metadata in your response to your clients um, you know, that are receiving your recommendations that they know that. Um, if streams upstream break or publish bad data, you know they might they might just drop data and push it to a dead letter queue. Um, Post processing might fail. How do you know that? And how can you react to that? Um, as a client, if you're looking up features from a feature store, how can you fall back to old values if a feature is missing for a day? Or how can you impute you know or you know, defaults or or missing values as a as a client? Um, and then you can also do th have things like schemas can evolve over time. So maybe you depend on some upstream system. Somebody decides they want to add a column or remove a column or compute some kind of uh, you know normalized data in a different way. 
in a lot of cases, this was one of our bigger problems in, in Gojek because different teams were working on different tables and systems and streams. Um, they wouldn't really communicate with us. And so we had to build a lot of defensive systems in order to protect our production environments and our production systems when those upstream systems changed. Um, so this is an area where Feast is increasingly investing in you know, our efforts. Our efforts. So in terms of correctness, you know, we're allowing. It's, so there's two areas. The one is data quality monitoring, and the other is more best practices around um, how do you manage your feature repository and your infrastructure and your data models. So with Feast data quality monitoring, you can do things like um, produce reference data sets when you train a model, and we persist that data set. And then we also, when you're running your model in production, you can log data from the online environment into an offline environment. And then you can compare this reference data set, this saved data set to your logged feature values, and then identify uh, you know, changes or in distributions or shifts in your data over time. Um, and so that's an area that's very nascent and it's experimental right now, but it's an area that you know, all of our users want, and it's like a, it's a class one problem. Um, and the second one that we also provide is that we encourage correctness by, uh, you know, cataloging and persisting schemas. Um, so we, you know, you define your models of your data in a feature repository and that, that Feast manages, and it can tell you when, that when you make changes to those schemas or those data models and you run a Feast plan command, it'll, Tell you the infrastructural changes that will um, be that will result from that from an, a feast apply. So just a, a quick like segue here into like how feast works. You have this repository, and then feast can update your infrastructure based on this repository. So this repository contains things like your entities, your features, um, and your feature services. And when you run a feast apply, it's just like Terraform apply. Um, it updates your infrastructure, so it can create tables, it can create, um, you know, all of the models within your storage systems that allow you to store the data for ingestion and serving. Um, and so Feast Plan is just going to tell you, like, these are the infrastructural changes that we will be making. And so you've got this, you know, base practices and this, um, kind of visibility into the evolution of your underlying infrastructure through. And so I think in a lot of cases, if you're working with batch, you're probably just using like SQL or Python. And in most cases, you know, if you're just completely offline, <clears throat> it's not really a challenge, right? Because you can just use um, the same libraries and tools um, for both of those environments. But correctness is harder to do in the offline online case because uh, a single transformation library isn't enough. And so it's hard to have the same feature transformations being applied. And so often you have this problem of rewriting SQL or Python transformations in a different language like Java or Go, because you have all of these you know, op operational latency concerns. And that doesn't just affect the latency, and, uh, um, but also the correctness of the data. Like, are you actually producing the right features and serving that to a model? So that's something that's also kind of tricky. Um, you can introduce things like Spark or Beam, but they require engineers, you know, a lot of cases to manage. Um, they're just complex by nature, and you know, it's not something that is very easy and quick to iterate on for a lot of data scientists. Um, and then, fast, uh, finally, you know, optimizing for fast iteration is not the same as optimizing for fast serving. So, in Feast, we have something called an on-demand feature view, and that's basically an abstraction that allows you to deal with incoming requests, um, like read time requests. So when you're looking up features, you can also provide some metadata and compute new features. Um, and we provide, for example, pandas as an abstraction there. And that is relatively inefficient at the like online stage, but it's very inefficient at the offline stage when you're doing training because you can use vectorized operations and you can work with you know, many different, many rows at the single uh, at the same time. But in, in the online case, it's kind of slow. And so um, there are trade-offs to be made depending on which um, kind of environment or phase of the development lifecycle you want to optimize for. Okay, so let's talk a bit about Feast and how Feast can actually improve or help out with some of these Rexus challenges. So a bit of background on Feast. So Feast is an open source feature store <clears throat> and uh, Feast has you know, support for a bunch of different environments like GCP and AWS and Azure. 
Um, we started on, on BigQuery, but we've you know, since uh, since then added support for for like Redshift, Mesos Sign Synapse. We we're working with the Snowflake folks, and they've actually built the Snowflake connector for us. We also support a bunch of online stores like Redis and you know Dynamo and Data Store, and uh, we're actually working with the GCP Bigtable team to now also add Bigtable support. Uh, we've got about three thousand members on our Slack. Um, we're um, we about I guess about 3,000 stars on, or 2,700 stars on uh, GitHub, uh, bi-weekly community calls. Um, and basically, you know, if there's there's just a need for us to, or a goal for us to remove a lot of the decision-making and how you build a, basically an abstraction layer on top of this offline, online um, kind of infrastructure required for uh, serving uh, data to machine learning systems. So feature stores are all about providing a single interface for your models, um, whether it's for training or for online serving. Um, you know, over the last couple of years, we've worked with a bunch of different companies. Um, some of them are listed down below. All of them have either directly contributed to Feast or are running Feast in production today. Um, we have you know, Shopify, Twitter, and Robinhood are the ones that are pretty active these these days, and in fact, Shopify and Twitter are also maintainers of Feast. So, at a high level, this is kind of the very basic, simplified logical diagram of how you would deploy a feature store. Um, you'd have some. So, if you just focus your eyes on the, the Feast in the center, the feature store consists out of an offline and online store. And so, in the offline store, they would be like your BigQuery or Redshift or Snowflake. Typically, typically some kind of like large scale analytic engine. Um, and you do a lot of your data modeling in that offline store. And typically you'd use like a DBT or you'd either use an Airflow or Spark. You compute your features. And that computer, computation today happens outside of the feature store. But over time, we'll be introducing more and more feature engineering flows there for data scientists to create features using Feast. Um, and so you have an offline store within the, the feature store. You have an online store like a Redis or a Dynamo that serves feature values online to your consumers, like your model services, um, you know, or you know whatever is re requiring features like your, you know, system that is you know, doing candidate lookups and, and calculating embeddings and things like that. Um, and so Feast also provides a feature server, and that's an API that allows you to look up these feature values. So we have both a Java and a um, Python feature server, and we have client libraries. And so if you, let's say you're using like Kubeflow or MLflow or any of these model serving stacks, you can just use one of our client libraries, call out to the feature store and read feature values. And all you need is basically like an entity ID, like a customer or a location or whatever you want to Fetch, fetch features from. Um, and that feature server can be deployed on AWS Lambda or Kubernetes. Um, it's containerized, so it's pretty easy to do that. And we make that really easy. Um, and for the offline flow, if you're training a model, we've also got an, an SDK and that just queries your offline store directly. So it'll basically just like query, BigQuery, build a point in time correct training data set. So it does the joins for you and then it'll export that for model training. Um, you can update the feature store um, you know, from these sources like your streams and your batch sources by running materialization commands or by running um, like d writing directly to the online store from streams. Um, and so typically you update the feature store by triggering materializations um, using an Airflow. Um, how we see most teams do this today is they'd have like an ETL pipeline and at the end of the ETL pipeline, they just trigger a feast materialize command. So if you're doing like batch computational features, that'll just upload those features into the feature store ready for your production systems to consume. So Feast helps with recommendation systems in a, in a few areas. Um, the first is it helps you manage your data sources. So typically in a lot of these <clears throat> recommender systems, there are three areas of data modeling that you're doing. You're doing um, item to pro or customer to product or you know, user to item type of relationships, like how, which items are user clicking on or which impressions they have. Um, so that relationship is very important to model. And then you have also item level features as well as um, user level features. Um, but even those user level features are being updated from different 
um, ETL pipelines and sources. Um, and so tracking or having a system that tracks all of these different data sources um, is very important. Having an awareness of all of this, the sources and especially the schemas involved and how they change over time and identifying drifts between your upstream sources and your production systems that are dependent on, on them. And so Feast helps with managing your, your data sources. It also allows you to track entities. And so you can track or version the um, specific you know, customers or users or um, you know, areas or all of those entities that are ultimately involved um, in retrieval and storage. And Feast increasingly with our DQM or data quality monitoring efforts, <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me, helps with prevention of skew. And so even today we have something called an on-demand feature view, which I spoke about earlier, that allows you to define a, a transformation and a Feast basically applies that transformation for you consistently. So it'll run that transformation online and offline when you're training a model or when you're serving the uh, features online in the same way. And so it prevents skew from occurring and catalogs that feature transformation for you um, in a central repository and registry. <clears throat> Feast also logs data out and allows you to identify data drift. And so over time, you'll you're more about us and our data quality monitoring efforts, but this is something that is pretty new in Feast, but it's something we're investing very heavily on. Um, it's just like making sure that you know we, we detect SKU for you and you don't have to do anything about that. Um, we also, we, you know, we abstract away all the data modeling and storage challenges. So you know, it doesn't matter which offline store or online store you're using or how you're retrieving data, we'll take care of the data modeling for you. Um, and increasingly we'll do more and more of this. So, um, you know, whether you're creating tables in a Redis or a big table or, you know, a, a, a BigQuery or Redshift and moving data between these or consuming, if consuming from both, we'll ensure that your models only see a single, um, you know, set of types, um, uh, regardless of the storage system. Um, and then finally, um, or the second last one is we uh, try and avoid, um, you know, deviations or, you know, poor practices in, in production across teams. So we do things like uh, integrate well with your CI systems and encourage best practices like uh, previewing infrastructural changes using Feast plan. Um, and in, this is an area of, you know, essentially organizing your repository and allowing for collaboration between teams using uh, Git and you know common best practices that are inspired by Terraform and Kubernetes, um, and so that's an area that we're also investing heavily into. Um, and then finally, Feast reduces effort to author features because it you know it does things like it point in time joins, which are very error prone for a user to do. It's a frequent occur a frequent source of label leakage. Uh, so if, when you're building a training data set, often the features that you're pulling from uh, come from different tables. And so Feast can handle the joins between those tables very seamlessly. So it's not just a kind of left join, you, it's the, the point in time requirements. Um, uh, basically there's a need for the model to see a view of historical data as it would with the online case. And so Feast can completely abstract and build those joins for you uh, without you having to deal with it. Uh, any questions on this slide? Yeah. Yeah, there's a question from Tim. Yes, yeah, sir. Maybe I can just um, jump in. Um, but yeah, I was just going to say so, uh, just from your documentation, Feast says they're not currently aiming to support kind of feature engineering. I, I guess it's kind of heavy feature engineering because you do have this feature transform capability. I just wanted to check what, what's kind of a typical use case for a feature transform that would be performance on Feast at the moment. Yeah. So, I guess it depends on your use case. So we only support Python transformations today, mostly because we wanted to introduce basic row level transformations. It is such a big requirement to support um, request or session based transformations that we had to support that. Um, otherwise users have to build that outside of Feast. Um, so we have Python today, um, you know, that latency there would not be super good. It's probably in the range of like, uh, I don't know, 30 to 50 milliseconds if you have a lot of data for Rex's use case. But for a lot of teams, that's tolerable. Um, we have some other teams that are currently working on lower latency um, 
you know, non Python based transformations. Um, but our general approach here is that we don't want to reinvent feature engineering for all these teams. Um, most companies already have, you know, DBT or Airflow pipelines or Spark pipelines where they do feature engineering. Um, we want to make sure that it's, we do a really good job of uh, loading and uh, ingesting and storing and serving those features. Um, but out of necessity, there will need to be some form of feature engineering within the feature store. And so we've introduced Python-based on-demand feature uh, transformations. Um, and then over time, we'll add lower latency versions um, and optimize that. And I think it's also reasonable for us to have some form of um, batch and streaming transformation, although it may only be you know, very simplistic. Um, but today it's mostly just featureization through Python libraries. You can think of it as basically UDFs. Does, right. it, does that make sense? Thanks. Yeah, no, that, that makes total sense, thanks. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so specifically, if you tie Feast to online recommender systems, there are specific areas where uh, Feast does a good job of like helping out with this problem. And the next slide, I'll show you an architecture diagram of what an end-to-end -end system would look like. Um, but you know, just like we were saying with these on-demand feature views, you know, they can deal with request time data. So when you're looking up features from the feature store, you provide some request time contextual data to the feature store, and it can compute or derive new features from that on the fly. Um, at a relatively low latency, um, and so you know that's one of the areas that Feast you know, is is well suited to help out. And then in the offline flow, it'll, Feast will also apply those transformations. And so, if you're building a training data set, it'll apply those same um, you know, post processing transformations. Feast also allows you to um, ensure that your features are fresh because it obviously can load from the offline store, but it will also allow you to write fresh features from a stream using um, client libraries that we provide. Um, and you know, if you know, latency is important. Um, and in a lot of cases, you know, you need to implement a two-towered approach. Um, so where you have like a candidate generation server um, and, and model, as well as a ranking model. Uh, and those two combined really optimize latency. Um, and Feast applies in both cases. Um, so Feast will be the source of features for both of those models. And um, I'll show you in a second what that looks like. And Feast um, also allows you to kind of deal with environmental differences between offline and online environments and does this through like, you know, unified data modeling um, and kind of reuse of features from both environments. So either it applies the same transformations or it ships data from the one environment into the other in a kind of transparent way for you. So this is a kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, this is kind of a logical diagram of um, what an end-to-end -end flow with a recommender system with Feast would be. So those little blue boxes are interactions where the Feast would be used um, to serve data to you. Um, so if you look at the like bottom, that API server, um, you're going to have some kind of incoming request. So let's look up some kind of, or let's surface some recommendations to a user. The first thing you do is you'd, You'd fetch some simple features for that user, and you do this with a get online features request to Feast. And those are features that you've pre computed um, and then stored within Feast, and your data scientists will be the ones doing that. The second step is you, you, know, you compute some kind of user embeddings from uh, those user features, and then you'd query, um, yeah, or you'd fetch, you'd, sorry, you'd fetch the user embeddings from the uh, user tower model server uh, using those user features. And those embeddings are then, <clears throat> yeah. So you, you so you'd fetch those embeddings, um, and then ultimately in the third step you'd fetch candidates with those embeddings from um, something like a a Mulvis or a scan, and those candidates are ultimately what's going to be ranked. And these are candidates would be the items that you ultimately want to rank, um, but those items are pre-computed, and and I think if you look at the top left, the retrieval model is the one that is. Um, producing those um, kind of embedding to item relationships. And those relationships come from a you know, ETL pipeline, sorry, not an ETL pipeline, a training pipeline and scoring pipeline that happens in an offline flow. And if you look at the like top left, that pipeline itself will also require a request features from Feast. So it'll request user features and item features. 
and then these kind of like um, transactional data, like the relationships between the users and items. And, and so it's going to basically do a dot product um, to look at like the relationship between users and items and what the probability is of a transaction and store those relationships within like a, an, an index, um, like a Mulvis or a scan. So if in the third step, you know, you have these user embeddings, you can then look up um, the relevant items. And, um, you know, so then when you have those items, you can fetch features for the users and the candidate items, and then you can re-rank them using a ranking model. Um, so this is a very common approach um, where you have this, this two-stage, two-tower approach of like producing candidates, producing a list of products or items that you want to surface. And then the second is let's optimize the, this list for customers. So based on the user features and based on the, the item features, you can then optimize it, um, you know, choose the best items to show to that user. And you'd use a ranking model. And this ranking model is also trained by um, querying features from Feast. Um, and then finally, when it's a, that list is ranked, you can just send the list of item IDs back to the customer. So uh, yeah, let me just stop there. And here's an example of an on-demand feature view. Um, if you just look at the code on the right, so this is what is defined within your feature repository. This is just a small little snapshot, but essentially what we're defining at the top there with the request feature view is a, a contract for what the calling client needs to provide to us when they retrieve features. So we're saying they need to give us the video category hot, one hot, um, you know, it's a list of integers. Um, they need to provide the last purchase time, and even the current timestamp. And we will use that as input data when we compute features, uh, but that's request time data. What we're gonna combine that with is uh, user features. Um, so if you look at the bottom part, the on-demand feature view, we're basically taking that incoming request and we're just computing features. So you can do things like feature crosses, like user age to item. What is the cross between those? Or the time since the last uh, last purchase, and you can just compute these with you know just normal pandas uh, data uh, pandas data frame and return that, and essentially this transformation will run when uh, feature lookups are being made, and you'll have fresher features because it's real time real uh, computed computed in real time. Um, Feast also runs this transformation in batch in the offline case, and ensures that you know there's consistency between both of these worlds and you'd store these transformations or this on-demand feature view and request feature view in your repository. And then Feast can just manage this transformation for you. Um, and so a feature repository consists out of many of these kinds of objects. So we have these views um, like on-demand feature views or just normal feature views. Um, we have things like entities um, and feature services. Um, and basically that is what makes up most of your, your feature repository. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can do all kinds of features. You can do time-related features, feature crosses, binning, um, user-level features that come from upstream systems like an ETL pipeline or item-level features. Um, uh, you can do target encoding or anything that you basically need. In the Rexus use case, this is particularly um, important because you often want to do feature crosses. Um, you, you are often working with embeddings or um, there's just a lot of like request time or event or session based information that's available and important to um, kind of overcoming the cold start problem. Cool. Um, so that's it. Uh, the Rex is basically tour de force of like why Feast helps out with recommendation systems. Uh, if you have more questions, uh, you know, you can feel free to ask now uh, or you can join our Slack at slack.feast.dev. Um, I'm also happy to dive into you know some of the documentation that we have on Feast Dev. You know, if some parts of this talk was a little bit abstract, happy to to dive into those details.